would you turn with me to 1 Timothy, the final chapter. 1 Timothy, chapter 6, please. So honored to be in the scriptures with you. 1 Timothy 6. I wrote down in my notes that I'm starting to read at verse 12, but then I looked at 11 and I can't get past 11, so we're just going to go to 11 first and head on through 12 and get to verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But as for you, O man of God, this is Timothy talking, being talked to by the Apostle Paul. So perfect for us because it was an older generation speaking to the younger generation. I would say over you, young ladies, but as for you, O woman of God, Flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Everybody say amen. amen. This picture we see of this unapproachable light, it, it made me think last night as Louis was building that scene for us out of Isaiah chapter 6. And now Isaiah in the vision saw the glory of God high and lifted up. And do you know that John's gospel tells us that the glory that he was seeing was Christ himself seated on that throne high and lifted up in John chapter 12. What I want to do with you is take out three different portions, three different words from this segment of scripture that we're going to look at together in our segment of time. Three different words, and the first one, the first term is time, T-I-M-E, time. We're going to draw out the concept of time because time is technically the very first thing that God ever created. That's why it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, boom, we already have the first click, the first tick of the clock. Time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In fact, there's this wonderful verse as early as Genesis 4:26 that says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Do you know, regarding time, history will show when the story is said and done. Every generation that chose to call upon the name of the Lord. Every generation that looked to his renown. Now in the Bible, time is linear. That means, and what makes such a big difference is that for many world religions, time is cyclical, but not for us. This means that time, when God created time, it had a beginning point, and it will have an ending point. This thing that is set in the middle of eternity called time. Doesn't mean that history never repeats itself. It simply means that we are, according to the book of Hebrews, appointed one time to die, and then that's when we see Jesus. So the point of time in the laying out of the kingdom calendar is that it has a beginning and it has an end and that God knows the end from the beginning. Now here's what I want you to see. This will track us the whole time we're together in this afternoon session. Biblically speaking, time always comes, it does not go. I hope to prove to you in the scriptures that when it comes to this thing called time that is set into eternity, that time is not going, time is continually coming. We have the sense that we are running out of time, but I hope to prove to you scripturally that we are running toward time, not away from it. We are running toward it. Time does not go, it comes. 
couple of examples. You can look this up uh, for yourself. Do a little word search and see. Over and over again, you would see the reference to time coming. I'm just going to pitch out a few to you. Luke 2, 6, and while they were there, this is Mary and Joseph, the time came, everybody say time came, for her to give birth. Galatians 4, 4 of the same event. But when the fullness of time had come, everybody say time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law. Now, when his brothers uh, asked him why he wasn't going up to the feast and presenting himself already publicly with his miracles as the one and only Messiah, Jesus said something very, very interesting to them in John 7, 8. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Lastly, Daniel 7, 22, speaking of a future event, says, And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Time is coming. And what I hope to prove to you is that time is working toward one huge event. And you see it right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want you to look at this verse with me, verses 14 and 15. To keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the word of God, all time is ticking toward one huge event. And that is when Jesus, beyond every shred of obscurity, will come ripping through the sky. It literally will tear open like a veil tearing and like a scroll unrolling. And he will be seen for every eye to see. And every single tongue will, under the compulsion by the very sight of him, have to proclaim that he is Lord. Now understand with me that when the Apostle John, who had walked with him for three solid years, seen him raised from the dead, when he got a glimpse of his immortal glory in the Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, at the sight of him, he fell like a dead man. This is what a grand sight the world has coming. And all of time, even from the first advent, Christ's first coming, the word made flesh to dwell among us. All of that was to get us to the second advent. He came, he was flesh dwelling among us, the God-man. He gave his life on the cross, was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent his spirit, and all of time has been ticking toward when he comes and every eye will see him in his full throttle glory, that's what we've got heaven, that kind of time, revving up instead of winding down. That's what I want you to hear, that we are not in the fleeting time. We are running toward an event for which all time was created, that by the time God had given the words to Moses in the beginning, the beginning had one ultimate end, when my son will come through the skies, proclaimed as king, crowned with many crowns, and there will be no one, no one who can withstand his glory. What I want to suggest to you is that even time is getting anxious for the big event because we have grown more and more obsessed with time. I want you to think about it. I did a little tracking on time, on how we have kept records of time throughout human history. And so I'm going to give you just a little bit of a, of uh, just a, a, the lowdown for exactly how that's played out over the centuries. That it started that before the sundial, time was simply seen in two increments. There was night and there was day, two times a day. Several thousand years before Christ, there was there was then the sundial. Then about 1,600 years before Christ, there was, um, there was a uh, water clock. And then about 330 AD, there were sand glasses. And then in the early 1500s, finally there were portable clocks. In 1577, the minute hand on our timekeepers was first invented, 1577. Mid-1700s, the seconds hand, I don't mean the second hand, but the one counting 
the seconds. Early 1900s, the term millisecond hit scientific vocabulary. So just, just see this with me. We've gone from two times a day to 24 hours a day to 60 minutes an hour to 60 seconds a minute to 1,000 milliseconds a second. Because time is getting anxious about time. Because time knows something is coming. There is something in us making us anxious, something we are working toward. And our minds tolerate the information as that it is time fleeing. We feel that time is going, but the Word of God says, oh no, there is a time coming. We are not getting further and further from the time of Christ, even though we are getting further from the first advent. Every single morning, we are day closer to the sight, breaking through the skies when his face will be seen by all with glory beyond anything we could possibly begin to understand. The prophetic word in the scripture is not getting less and less relevant. It is getting more and more relevant. It means more today for you to have it in your lap than it meant for your great-grandparents to have it because it's becoming more and more relevant, that which he prophesied. Now, what, what does all this mean to us and what difference would it make if we began to think that we were not on a count down, but we were on a count up? Well, if God was looking at his iPhone, it'd make all the difference in the world because he would not be going by a timer. He would be going by a stopwatch. Now, I want to show you a bit, just so that you can have some kind of idea of what I'm talking about. I brought a little clip because what is the difference between a stopwatch and a timer? And I want you to watch it go because one of them is going to have time going and one is going to be going toward a time. Would you just take a look for the next couple of seconds at the difference? Now, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to get your phones out. You may be reading uh, off your, the screen of your phone right now uh, with your scriptures, but whatever you need to do, if you have got a feature on it that has a stopwatch, I want you to go to it right now. I just want you to humor me and go to it. Get out your phone. Go to your stopwatch. And when I say so, I want you to push start. Everybody got their phone out? Everybody got the feature. So now, like, just three, two, one, push start. Now, humor me because I'm a, I'm a school teacher, and if, if you're willing to take notes, I, I just wish so much, much that you would, even if you do it in the notes on your phone, however you happen to do it, Put that timer away, that stopwatch away in your mind for a moment. Just, just let it keep ticking. Just let it keep ticking. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to just draw a little mock-up of what will one day be your headstone. I want you to think graves for a moment. I want you to think when our time comes and in our mind it goes. And I want you to just picture something that would be on the very front of it. So I'm asking you to get out your pen and I want it to look like this. I want you first of all to put your name on the very top of it. Now, put your whole name, unless your whole name is so ridiculous that it somehow distracts the person sitting next to you. Uh, I have one of those. Uh, just kind of stick with whatever you want to be called by the person next to you. Write your name down, and underneath it, I want you to write down your date of birth, and then a dash, and then I just want you to leave that blank, if you would, please. Just leave that blank. We're going to go back and fill it in in just a moment. So at this point, you've got your name, you've got your date of birth, you've got you a dash, and you've got you a blank. Here's what I want you to do if you're not doing it on your phone. I'm not sure how you would do that, but if, you, if you're writing it down, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to that headstone, and I want you to circle that dash.
Now, in your mind, I want you to take that tiny dash and I want you to just pull it out just like this with a beginning and an end because you are staring. That tiny little dash is your own timeline. You have been entrusted with time. I have been entrusted with time. Not only have we been entrusted with time, we've been entrusted with this exact time this exact generation, and our lives are about as long as a dash. James 4.4 4 says that we're a mist that appears for a short time. So we're gonna have had a dash, and then it's gonna vanish. And we could have a mad dash, we could have a sad dash, we could have a bad dash, we could have a fad dash, we could have a glad dash, but when the time comes, one thing is for certain, you will have had your dash, and I will have had my dash. Now here's what I want you to do. Go back to that blank now. You've got this, this uh, mock-up of your headstone. We don't want to be morose. We just want to make a point. And I want you to put where you've got your blank. You've got your name. You've got your date of birth. And fill in the blank with this. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ. Whatever comes first. Whether we die and he is revealed to us then, or whether he breaks through the sky and we see him revealed. But time for us is complete. Does not mean our lives are over? We have eternal life. But it means this thing, this trust called time, that is always earthbound, the references to time, and there are nearly 700 times the word time is used in the scripture. That every single time, it is always earthbound. It's something that has to do with the goings-on on planet Earth. Now, each generation has a very important place in time. But I think it's fair to say that the later the date, the greater the trust. That's one reason why we are so interested in you. Because we believe, because of the prophetic scriptures, that the later we get... In the kingdom calendar, the more important it is that the word is handled carefully and that the name of Christ is proclaimed throughout the entire globe. The word says that his, his testimony will go into every single nation, every single tongue, every single people group, and then the end will come. So the later the date, the greater the trust. Um, Romans 13, 11 says something like this because it says this. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So this is for sure, even though we can't set a date, we can say this. The revelation of Jesus Christ is a day closer than it was yesterday. I mean, today when you got up, the reason why this can be the best day of your life is because... You are one day closer to seeing the face that changes everything. To seeing a glimpse. When, when Louis was talking to us last night about just seeing him revealed in such a way, you get a glimpse of him. Can you imagine? Because we're just getting these glimpses of him in, in, little, um, in unveilings, in, in moments of, of glory that he shows us something of himself. And it's so real to us that it pivots our entire life on our timeline. Imagine what it would be like when we see that face. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says it this way. In a favorable time, I listened to you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Listen, here's what that scripture is saying. If you can say now, then it's time. Amen? If you, because now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. So at any point that a generation can say the word now, it is time. Because any time there's a now, it is time for the proclamation of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is no other name. We're told several times in the New Testament that we are to make the best use of time. Ephesians 5, 16, Colossians 4, 5. Redeem the time. We've taken out three terms from our segment of Scripture. And the first one has been what? Tell me again. The second one is the term fight. Fight. I want you to hear those words again out of verse 12. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Fight. The good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you make the, made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
fight the good fight of faith. I want you to see that word good because it's a very important word. Fight the good fight because what I want to suggest to you this afternoon is this. There is a good fight and there is a bad fight. That word, that adjective, a good, is a wonderful word. It means exactly that in the original language. It means good, just like you think of good. But it's a word that can also be translated beautiful. Beautiful. So we would not be stretching the text to say back over it, fight the beautiful fight. Fight the beautiful fight. And I want to suggest to you that there is a beautiful fight and there is a very, very ugly fight. I've come to you this afternoon to say to you, you're going to have to pick your fight. Anybody? Because listen, something was born in us. Even an infant, even a, a premature infant will fight to live. You and I were born with a fight in us. One of the most important things we could do at this conference this weekend, on this day, and in this moment, is come to a place where we just pick our fight. Because you cannot fight every single battle. You gotta pick your fight, and I gotta pick my fight. There's an ugly fight, and there's a beautiful fight. The ugly fight is really, really near it. One of the most um, spectacular fights we have going on in the Christian community is right here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, described as well. Look with me at 1 Timothy 6, and I wanna go to verse 3. It says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is an aside, but that word sound right there, and it, some of your Bibles will even footnote it. it. It is a word that means healthy. It was originally a medical term. Healthy words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. I want you to just look at the fight because what we can do and what the enemy is getting a tremendous amount of press doing, I mean, it is the, the, the cosmic joke in the principalities of darkness that the enemy can keep us fighting with one another in the body of Christ so vehemently and keep us so busy at it that we never even fight the good fight. Are we going to fight one another? I mean, really? Are we going to spend our time, spend our energy, spend all our effort, and we're going to fight one another instead of fighting the darkness? We have to decide because we cannot fight both battles at once. We will not fight the good fight and fight the ugly fight at the same time. You're going to have to pick your fight. Look around to one another and say, you're going to have to pick your fight. You've you got to pick your fight. You can't have a beautiful fight and an ugly fight going at the same time. There comes a time when we decide we're either going to fight for people or we're going to fight with them. And it will be a tremendous temptation for you to get wrapped up in all the controversies and all the division in the body of Christ. I want you to look around this room at the vast army that you are. What would happen? Can you imagine why the enemy has so much at stake if he keeps us all fighting with one another? Because look what would happen if we didn't. What would happen if we would unify around the life, the saving death, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ instead of 300 different things that we find different interpretations on. What will we do? Which will we fight? Because we won't fight all of it. There's a good fight. There's a beautiful fight. The body of Christ is bloody from the blows of one another and the ugly fight of faith has two fists and it is ego and it is control. There comes a time when our hands are put to a different plow and we decide we do want to fight or we do have some energy to fight. Everything in us wants to fight, but we're going to come together and we're going to fight the beautiful fight. We're going to fight for people and not against people. We're going to stop fighting with each other and we're going to start unifying together to fight the kingdom of darkness in our day, to fight slavery, to fight poverty, starvation, 
There are things worth fighting for on this planet. Let's put our fight together and let's make it beautiful. We got to pick our fight. I'm not talking about that there's not a place for healthy debate and discussion and disagreement. But what is in Christ is done in love with mutual esteem. Not the hatefulness that we can see out there. Not the public slander. Be no part of it. Be, decide now at your age. You will be no part of that. Many of you will become mighty leaders in the faith. Do not take that on. It is a waste of time. Decide what you're going to do with that fight in you. Revelation 12, 12 says that the devil is furious because he knows his time is short. That means that in our day, here's what happens. That the closer and closer we get to the return of Christ, the matter and matter the enemy gets. And let me tell you why. Because the enemy knows God's word is true. The enemy has no doubt that God will fulfill his prophetic word. He absolutely will. He is batting a thousand. He will to the end. He will not break a single promise. The enemy knows it. So the more he looks around and sees the signs of the times, the matter he gets. It is imperative, more imperative for you than it was for my generation and than it is for my generation to fight the beautiful fight of faith and not the ugly one that leaves us bloody. I want you to see verses um, 18 and 19 out of 1 Timothy 1. Turn with me to those passages just a moment. 1 Timothy 1, same book. Verses 18 and 19. 1 Timothy 1, 18. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. I want you to look at those words again. I entrust this to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Another way to say fight the good fight, that you may fight the good fight. Now I want to tell you something. You, you lock into that good conscience for a minute because I'm going to tell you something right now. The scripture tells us that because of Christ, we are sprinkled. I want to give it to you out of Hebrews uh, 10, uh, 23 through 25. And there's a beautiful segment to read about our assurance in him. And it says, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from a guilty conscience. Let me tell you, if the enemy could use anything to put distance between you and God, it will be something that is messing with you and your conscience. We have a place to bring that right to the foot of the cross. It's what Jesus died for. And here's what I want to tell you, in that little timeline, that little dash that becomes your timeline, we are so busy looking back over our shoulder at something that happened and a dot behind us on our timeline. We cannot even get on with it. We're fighting our own conscience. It's so just being cleansed. Just believe in what he said about us from the first place. Believing what God's word says is true. And listen, notice that he says to Timothy, prophecies have been spoken over you. But he said, you got to fight the good fight. And I want to tell you something. Prophecies have been spoken over you. Every single generation until the return of Christ. The powerful standing in our generation that you have. On this globe at this time, you have been chosen for this time, chosen for this time, and you are an army. And in terms of your divine calling, it could be that you've had all manner of prophecy spoken over you. But do you know you're going to have to fight for it? If the if of your calling is going to be the win of its fulfillment, between your if and your win will be a fight. You've got to fight. You've got to fight. This place is a fight. We fight the good fight. In my um, time of prayer a couple of mornings ago, I came upon Isaiah 60, verse 22, and I can't claim this. Um, it's not something I'm saying that, uh, that God is bound to in this place and in this generation. I'm just saying it came up in my prayer time, and I felt a searing in my heart to pray it over every single one of you. And it says this, and I'm reading out of the NET Bible. The least of you will multiply into a thousand. 
The smallest of you will become a large nation. And when the right time comes, I, the Lord, will quickly do this. Listen to that. Does anybody else want to receive that? The least of you will multiply into a thousand. Anybody? Anybody? The least of you will multiply. So I just began to pray it. And I want you to know I will leave from this place praying this over you. That every single one of you in this room, that the very least you will reach in your lifetime for Christ will be a thousand. That's what I'm praying. I mean, you don't have to agree with me in it. But that's what I'm praying. That you at your worst work, you at your very worst will multiply into a thousand. Because gospel math multiplies. Over and over in this, Acts 6, 7. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. Acts 9, 31. And being in the Holy Spirit, they multiplied over and over again. Gospel math is multiplication. Anti-gospel math is division. Division. It will always be division. Listen, you sold out at 17,300 registrations in this house. 17,300 registrations. I did a little basic math. And if the least of you multiplied into a thousand, that would be 17 million 300,000. 17 million 300,000. That is three times the population of this city. If just one of you, on your worst day, that when your dash is over and you did the poorest of anyone in the room, you multiplied into a thousand. Would that just be anything anybody would want in this room? Because it's what I would want. It's what I would want. I want you to look at the third term with me. We've got two terms so far. The first term was what? Second term was what? And the third term is confession. I want you to see this because you're going to see that word good again come up. You're going back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and it says, verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good profession in the presence of many witnesses because Christ had made a good confession. The verse goes on to say in the next portion. I want you to see something. Now, Our confession, to make a good confession, to make a beautiful confession about Christ is to say what Christ said and to say what Christ said about himself and then to go so far as to say what Christ said about us. Listen, um, I want to say something to you. We are supposed to be under... um, communicators of the gospel, teachers and preachers of the word. Stay under it. You must. But let me tell you something. When it comes to who you believe Jesus Christ to be, get in your Bible. Get in your Bible. Pick one of the gospels. Read it in the next month. Read the gospel. That's Jesus. There is no other Jesus. That's what Jesus can do. That's what he's capable of. Nothing is too difficult for him. That's your Jesus. Do not let somebody else tell you who Jesus is. You go into the scriptures, you read the scriptures, you come out with faith in that Jesus, and that is a Jesus that can take you all the way home, all the way home, all the way home. Remember that good word, the good fight, the beautiful fight? Same here, beautiful confession. And let me tell you something. We think of confession as only confession of sin. Uh, In the original language, the word confession means to speak in agreement with. So when the scripture tells us to make confession of sin, uh, what we do is this. We come in prayer and go, listen, Jesus, I agree with you about this. It's not what you wanted for me. It's not where you want my mind to be. It's not where you want my body to be. It's not what you want for me. This is so much less than what you have for me. And so I agree with you on it. And I accept your forgiveness and, and your cleansing. That's confession. But if our confession only goes as far as our confession of sin, we're going to be weak in our faith. I want to show you this afternoon before I I walk off this platform what it means to make confession. Yes, confession of sin, but there's a whole lot of confession to have out there. Confessing sin is by a long shot not all we confess. Scripture tells us to hold fast to our good, confection, our good confession. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want us to practice this. Keep your phones close by because we're going to end with that. But I want you to stand to your feet in the last couple of moments we have together. And I want you to make confessions with me. Because this is what it means to go to the Word and to confess, to make our good confession. It, is, it means to state our belief in what we know to be the truth. So here's what I'm going to do. I picked out 20 things, all 20 of which I believe without a shadow of a doubt in my mind. I do. You go search it and see if it is so. I believe that every single one of these 
are scriptural. Every single one comes off the pages of scripture. But I'm gonna make a statement and then I simply want you to decide, do you agree or do you not agree? If you do not agree, just stay silent. But if you do agree, I want you to say, I agree. And maybe to the extent that you do agree, maybe you could agree with some volume and some passion. Now, 20 statements, now don't agree with anything you don't agree with. But I want you to get the feeling what it's like to come confessing the good, the beautiful confession of faith, what it means to agree with what Christ has said about himself, about us, and about our future. So here's what we're gonna do, 20 succinct confessions of faith. I'm gonna make a statement, and at the end of the statement, if you agree, you're just simply going to go, I agree. That's confession, here we go. I believe Jesus is the Holy Son of God. I believe he came to earth as God wrapped in human flesh. I believe Jesus Christ was crucified for us and took on all our sins. I believe Jesus Christ conquered death and on the third day rose again. I believe he ascended to heaven and took his seat at God's right hand. I believe Jesus sent his own spirit to dwell in all who receive him. I believe we are each completely known and lavishly loved. I believe we are saved by grace alone. I believe we are completely forgiven and made spotless in Christ. I believe that God can redeem any life, any hurt, or any failure. I believe that in Christ all things are possible. I believe that nothing is too difficult for Jesus. I believe we are each known by name and we are each called to divine purpose. I believe we can do more than we've yet done. I believe we can see more than we have yet seen. I believe we are a chosen generation. I believe in the power and the authority of God's word. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back. I believe that Jesus Christ is the coming King. I believe that every eye will see him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Because I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I want you to pull those phones back out. Praise you, Lord. That is your beautiful confession. That, beloved, that is your beautiful confession. Can you confess that? You get up in the morning and you confess that. That makes it the best day of your life. You get up, make your beautiful. What is it you believe? And why do you believe it? Get your phone out. When I say so, everybody push. Stop. Go back to your stopwatch. Let me tell you, the face of Jesus is going to break the face of every clock. That's where time culminates. One, two, three, stop. Just stare at that. Comparatively speaking, that's just about how long you've got on this planet. This long, one tiny dash. No one can tell you what to do with it. It's your trust but you will get one time for this, one time for this, one time to be a benefit to this world, one time on this globe, one time for this to matter for souls around this planet, one time, take your 